Hi guys, and welcome back to Logical Redstone Reloaded. Last episode, we talked about latches and flip-flops. Today, we're gonna create some really cool sequential circuits. I hope you enjoy. Let's start with some terminology. Back in episode six, I said that all the circuits in that episode were combinational. The output of a combinational circuit depends on only the input. Once you input something, you automatically know what the output will be. It's predetermined by a truth table. But the circuits we'll see today are not combinational. Instead, they're called sequential. The output of a sequential circuit depends on not just the input, but also the state of the circuit itself. For example, this is the T flip-flop from the previous episode, which toggles whenever the button is pressed. So what will the output be when I press this button? It depends, right? It depends on the state of the T flip-flop. If the previous output was zero, the next one will be one. And if it was one, the next one will be zero. Therefore, a T flip-flop is a sequential circuit. In fact, all latches and flip-flops are sequential circuits for the same reasoning. So for the rest of this episode, let's build up a toolbox of some useful sequential devices. Remember that a data latch, or a D latch, can be made with just a repeater lock, and it allows us to capture one bit of information. But one bit is not very much, so let's stack eight repeater locks on top of each other and combine all the latching signals together with a glass tower. This is called a register. Specifically, this is an 8-bit register, so it can store any 8-bit number you want. To store a number, simply put it in the back and activate this 2-tick pulse generator to quickly unlock and relock the repeaters. As you can see, the repeater locks are now storing the number. If I want to store a different number instead, I can simply put it here and press the button again. This is called loading a register. Sometimes it's called writing to a register as well, but I prefer saying load. Additionally, it can be useful to have a read function as well. This is an 8-bit register with both load and read. The load button does the same thing as before, loading the repeater locks with the data. But now the data is not shown on the output because it's being canceled by these comparators. Pressing the read button will quickly uncancel the comparators, giving us an output and allowing us to read the data. Next, let's talk about binary counters. A binary counter stores a binary number, and every time you press the count button, it increments by one. To make this, I'll start by having a T flip-flop for every single bit, and you'll see why in just a minute. Now, notice from this table that as you count up in binary, the rightmost bit, or the one bit, toggles between zero and one. You can see the pattern of the one bit going zero, one, zero, one, forever. So let's just plug the count signal into the rightmost T flip-flop. Now every time we count up, it will toggle between 0 and 1. Okay, so the 1 bit is already done. The next question is, when should the 2 bit toggle? Well, looking at the table again, we can see that the 2 bit toggles whenever the 1 bit is carrying over. In other words, when the 1 bit goes from 1 to 0. And what's really cool is that this property generalizes to any bit when counting up in binary. The 4 bit toggles whenever the 2 bit goes from 1 to 0, and the 8-bit toggles whenever the 4-bit goes from 1 to 0. With redstone, we can detect this using a torch. A torch will turn on when a signal goes from 1 to 0. So let's put a torch on the output of every T flip-flop and plug them into the toggle signals of the next bit over. When the 1-bit goes from 1 to 0, it will toggle the 2. When the 2-bit goes from 1 to 0, it will toggle the 4, etc. And now, this is a binary counter. When you press the count button, you get 1, 2, three, four, etc. This type of counter is called a ripple counter because the toggles ripple across the counter. And you can repeat this pattern for as long as you want to make a counter of any size. Of course, there are many other designs for a ripple counter as well. Here's one made by Seth Bling that I thought was really cool. It just uses pistons and observers where each piston acts like a T flip-flop. When we give it an update, you can see that on the wool blocks, it's actually counting up in binary. The green wool is 1 and the red wool is 0. And here's another ripple counter I found on Reddit which is absolutely tiny. It's a little difficult to read the binary, but it's in the observers as they pop out. 1, 2, 3, 4, yeah. Okay, so ripple counters are great, but they suffer from the same problem that the ripple carry adder did. As your counter gets larger, the toggles take longer and longer to propagate. So let's design a synchronous counter or a counter that always gives an output completely synchronized. To do this, let's start by analyzing the case of seven. When going from seven to eight, ask yourself this question, why should the eight bit toggle? 
If you asked a ripple counter this question, it would say, well, the one bit toggled, which toggled the two, which toggled the four, and then the eight. But we're smarter than a ripple counter. We have a much better reason. And that is that all the bits to the right of the eight bit are one. In fact, the only time any bit toggles is when all the bits to the right of it are one. I mean, look at what happens when you increment seven. Every single bit gets toggled because every bit is followed by all ones. The eight bit is followed by all ones. The four bit is followed by all ones. The two bit is followed by all ones. And the one bit, well, the one bit always toggles. As another example, to increment 1011 or 11, I can just toggle the bits that are followed by all ones. In this case, that would be the four bit, the two bit, and the one bit not the 8-bit because there's a 0 coming after the 8-bit. And sure enough, toggling those bits gives us 1100, which is 12. Perfect. This is the logic behind a synchronous counter. Any bit toggles whenever all the previous bits are 1. And if you want a fun challenge, pause the video now and try making one yourself. I haven't done one of these challenges in a while, so why not bring them back? All right, welcome back. While you were gone, I found this, which is one of my favorite designs for a synchronous counter. As you can see, there is no rippling. The output is completely synchronized. The way this is implemented with redstone is actually really clever. Notice that this type of T flip-flop is completely disabled when this redstone is forced on. So if you place a torch on all the previous bits and wire them into the redstone, you've essentially made it so that it can only toggle when all the previous bits are one. Once they're all one, all the torches turn off, and now it can toggle. So that's the strategy being used in this synchronous counter. The only way a bit can toggle is once all the previous torches turn off, aka all the previous bits are one. This counter also has a beautiful vertical design using a glass tower, making it incredibly fast and compact. And it's expandable up to eight bits. Well, as long as the redstone reaches, you might need a target block at the top. But yeah, I can't express how much I like this design. It's my go-to whenever I need a binary counter. It's small, fast, and of course, completely synchronized. Before moving on to the next sequential device, I have one more surprise for you that makes this counter even better. Since the repeater locks are stacked on top of each other now, it's relatively easy to implement a load function as well. This is a synchronous counter with load. To increment the counter, press the count button, and it counts up just like before. But now you can also load it with something else. Simply put the data you want to load here and press load. And if you press the count button again, it will just continue counting from whatever we loaded, which is super cool. And that's about it for binary counters. As always, if you ever want to take a closer look at any of this redstone, the world download is in the description. Next, let's talk about shift registers. A shift register simply stores a number and allows you to shift it. This is an 8-bit shift register that allows you to shift the data upwards. When you press the shift button, the data moves up by one. To make this, I just took a normal register and plugged every output up into the next highest input. So by unlocking and relocking the repeaters with the shift button, the register gets loaded with the shifted up version of its own data. And here's a version that shifts down instead of up. It looks almost exactly the same. The data just moves down this time. One of the reasons shift registers are so useful is because in binary, shifting up multiplies by two and shifting down divides by two. For example, this is the number six. Shifting up makes it 12 and shifting down makes it three. You can also use a horizontal design to shift data to the left or right. This one over here shifts data to the left and this one shifts data to the right. The one problem with these designs, which you might have already noticed, is that there's no load function. And without a load function, the only way to get data into a shift register is to load it in one bit at a time. For example, if I wanted to put a four into this, my only option is to load a one from the bottom and shift it up twice. So this next device is an upwards shift register with a load function. You can load data by putting it here and pressing load, and you can shift it up by pressing shift. The way this works is with a multiplexer. The shifted data and the load data are both being canceled by comparators. If you press shift, then the shifted data gets uncanceled and the repeater locks capture it. But if you press load, the load data gets uncanceled and once again, the repeater locks capture it. And of course, using this exact same technique, you can add a load function to a downward shift register as well. Next, let's look at a bi-directional shift register. As the name suggests, you can shift the data both up and down using these buttons. And this bi-directional shift register has a load function as well. So you can literally put in any data you want and immediately shift it up or down. 
Now, it's worth mentioning that you don't need to have two sets of repeater locks to make this device. I just chose to do that because it makes the wiring a little bit easier. Honestly, you can just imagine them as one set of repeaters because they're always kept the exact same. But with that out of the way, this device is not any more complicated than the previous two. It's really just another multiplexer. This time it's a three-way multiplexer between the upshifted data, the downshifted data, and the load data. Whichever option we choose out of these three buttons, the corresponding data gets uncancelled and then captured by the repeater locks. Also, bidirectional shift registers can be made horizontally too. Here's a design that I made a long time ago using pistons. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a load function, but you can still shift left and shift right. And the last shifting device I want to show you is a bit of a special one. If you take a shift register with a single bit in it and you plug the output all the way back into the input, it becomes a ring counter. The bit travels around and around the register as if it was on a circus ring, I guess? I actually don't know why they're called ring counters, someone enlighten me in the comments. But yeah, these come up every once in a while and they can be pretty useful. You can also hook up an encoder to a ring counter and now you have a way to go through any sequence you want. You could make it a binary counter, or a fake prime number generator, or even another ring counter. It's up to you. Next up, this device allows you to keep a running total as you add binary numbers. For example, starting from 0, I can add 3, and then add 2 to the total to get 5, and then add 4 to the total to get 9. This works by combining a register with an adder. Whatever is currently in the register comes around here and gets added with whatever number you want, which is then plugged back into the register. I'm not exactly sure what this device is called. I've heard some people call it an accumulator, but it's possible that it doesn't really have a name. Also, it's worth mentioning that if you just keep the added number as one, it becomes a binary counter. And if you make the added number all ones, which is negative one in two's complement, it counts down instead of up. So yeah, I really like this device because it's basically a counter with more freedom. And if you wanted to do a different operation, you could always just swap out the adder for something else. All right, so all the circuits we've seen so far have only worked with eight bits at a time. But what if you wanted to work with more memory? Well, you could just make a bigger register, but a better strategy is to combine many registers together into a single system. This is a device that combines eight registers together into a single memory bank. Each register is given an address, 0 through 7, which is basically that register's unique identifier. Using this input panel, I can write to or read from any of the registers. For example, let's write a 15 to register 3. The 15 goes here, the address of 3 goes here, and then we press write. Let's also write a 10 to register 2. The 10 goes here, the 2 goes here, and write. Now that we've loaded some registers, let's try reading them. I'll put in a 3 and read, and look at that, we get 15. Or if we read what's at address 2, we get 10. Very nice. And let me show you how the actual redstone works too, because I think it's really cool. Basically, the write signal in green is attempting to write to every single register, but it will only go through if that register has been decoded for by this decoder. So by putting an address here, we're unlocking only the register with that address. If I unlock the third register, then when I press write, only the third register gets written to. And it's the exact same idea with the read signal. If I unlock the second register and press read, only the second register gets read. And that's most of the complexity. From there, you just add your registers on top, combine all the inputs together, and combine all the outputs together. Finally, let's talk about some hexadecimal devices. This is a signal strength memory cell. It's just two comparators in a loop. You can think of this like a data latch, but for any signal strength 0 to 15. If I input a 3, the 3 gets stored in the cell. And to store a new number, I can just reset the cell and input something else. I use this type of memory whenever it's more convenient to store hex values than binary values. For example, in my 2048 game, every tile was stored internally as a single hex value. Another useful device is the hexadecimal incrementer slash decrementer. When I press this button, the signal strength counts up, and when I press this button, the signal strength counts down. Another cool thing you can do with signal strength is create a decaying signal. This is a comparator loop where the signal strength inside of it will decay by 1 after every cycle. If I input 15, then it decays to 14, 13, 12, etc. 
This can be used to create super small redstone timers, because when I press this button, the redstone won't turn off for a very long time. Only once the signal on the inside decays to zero will the redstone finally turn off. Next episode, we'll talk about displays. I'll see you there. If you enjoy these videos, subscribe and check out my Patreon page in the description. I also have a Redstone Discord server, so come join us if that sounds interesting. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed. Peace out, guys.